the floating field how a group of Thai boys built their own soccer field by Scott Riley illustrated by Nguyen Kwong and Kim Lian the floating field what's most important is that anything is possible and as a community or team you can overcome incredibly impossible odds. Prasit Hemen, founding member of the Panier Football Club. Ko Panier, Thailand, 1986. Prasit Hemen lived in a village on stilts. Prasit woke early each morning before school to help his father. Together they loaded the longboat with nets while his mother brewed coffee and sliced jackfruit in the kitchen. Like many villagers, Prasit's father spent his days fishing for groupers and prawns. He spent his nights tying nets and dreaming of the next day's catch. But Prasit dreamed of things other than fish, and last night the moon had been full. Prasit's father revved the boat's motor and headed out to sea. Prasit waved, then raced along the raised walkways to Uncle's coffee shop. The others were already there. Uncle welcomed Prosit and his friends with plates of fried dough. Between sugary bites, the boys made important decisions. Who will carry the poles? Who's on which team? Who gets to kick off first? Above them, the full moon had set and the sun was rising. Below them, the tides were already shifting. The moment school ended, the boys rushed to the pier. The tide was finally out and a sandbar glistened in the distance. The boys jumped into a boat and paddled furiously. Prosit and his friends planted the poles and got into position. With the ball in play, they dug in their toes and chased it across hard packed ripples of sand. They weaved in between other players to get open. And when they got close, they took a shot. Goal! Back and forth the boys played as longboats returned from the sea, full of fathers and fish. Waves soon crept in, the field narrowed, in minutes the sandbar disappeared, and the game was over. Prosit and his friends drifted back to the pier, their laughter echoing off the cliff. With the sandbar gone, the boys could only dream about playing until the tides were low enough once more. But this month, the boys could still watch the game they loved. The World Cup was on, and the teams from across the globe were playing in a far-off place called Mexico. At Uncle's coffee shop, the boys huddled around the television, the only one on the island. One day, after cheering for a team that came back from behind, someone suggested they form their own team. Everyone agreed, but a real soccer team needed a real field. Prosit looked out to where the sandbar lay hidden under the sea. He thought about their floating village built from nothing but wooden planks and metal roofs. We could make our own field, he offered. The boys nodded in agreement. The next day after school, the boys scattered. Some searched for scraps of wood and empty barrels. Others swam out to abandoned fish farms to collect loose styrofoam. At the pier, they stacked materials and began building. Hammers flew, nails bent, boards split. Prosit and his friends had no plan. Somehow, that didn't matter. For days, the boys collected wood from broken boats and old docks. Arms full, they hauled it all back to the pier. Prosit handed planks down to boys in boats. Drifting in the tides, they fixed them to floating barrels and makeshift buoys. Villagers heard what the boys were up to. Some walked by shaking their heads. One even shouted, You're crazy! Look around you! You can't play soccer! Not here! But the boys didn't listen. Sea eagles wheeled overhead as they worked. 
barrels and boards formed a platform. Some boys tethered it down below. Others painted the edges. A few began to frame knee-high goalposts. After weeks of work, their floating field was complete. With fishnet goals at each end, it teetered in the waves. No longer needing the moon to tug at the tides, Prosset and his friends headed straight to their field each day after school. Loose boards and bent nails forced fancy footwork. So did the field's sidelines. When the ball bounced into the water, the kicker had to follow. With the ball in play, they bounced on their toes and chased it across rickety boards. The ball moved faster now and the boys raced to keep up. They weaved in between other players to get open. And when they got close, they took a shot. Goal! Villagers still walked by, but they no longer shook their heads. Instead, they stopped to watch. Some even cheered. When news of an upcoming tournament on the mainland reached the island, the boys decided to take a chance and sign up. On the morning of the tournament, Prosset and his friends walked to the pier in their mismatched jerseys and ragtag shorts. Before their longboat pushed off, a group of villagers ran toward them. Some carried baskets, others waved their hands. The boys hadn't been the only ones planning for the tournament. Reaching into their baskets, friends and family members pulled out new jerseys matching shorts, and a pair of cleats for each player. The boys beamed. So did the villagers. The Pony Football Club was born. Later that morning on the mainland, the island boys got into position for their first game, this time on a field of grass. Across from them, opponents bounced on toes, ready to play. Prosset and his team stood flat-footed, nervous. But with the ball in play, the boys remembered what to do. They passed it down the field, they weaved in between other players to get open, and when they got close, they took a shot. Goal! By that afternoon, after winning several games, the Pony Football Club had reached the semifinals. Once again, Prosta and his team lined up and waited for the referee's whistle. As the game began, the sky darkened. Within minutes, sheets of rain came pouring down, drenching uniforms, filling cleats, and flooding the field. The other team adjusted. Prossets did not. At the half, the Pony Football Club was down 2-0. to zero. The boys sat silently on the bench, raindrops pelting their heads. They needed to turn the game around. Prosset looked at his friends, his teammates. He thought about how they played on their floating field. Reaching down, he unlaced his shoes and peeled off his socks. His teammates followed, nodding barefoot. They ran back onto the field. Without waterlogged shoes, the boys moved quickly, just like they always had. Passing give-and-goes and racing to the goal, the Pony Football Club scored twice. With only minutes to play, both teams battled for the ball. Finally, a player from the other team trapped it, dribbled down the field, and struck it one more time. The ball sailed into the net, just past the goalie's reach. The boys from Copagny had lost, but that day, in that very first tournament, the Pony Football Club came in third place. On their way back home, Prosset and his teammates yelled and cheered over the boat's rattling motor. As the boys drifted back to the pier, their laughter echoed off the cliff once again. But this time, they didn't have to dream about when they'd play next. They had their floating field, where they could play the game they loved whenever they wanted. In this 2019 photo, 
The Pony Football Club practices on a recently built paved platform next to the school. Copanyi's current floating field includes a blue covering and green plastic buoys. Copanyi extends far into Pongna Bay. Its more recent walkways are made of logs and planks, while older walkways are made from concrete. Copanyi's gold domed mosque is a defining feature and cultural heart of the village. Today, Prasit and his family still live in Copanyi. He says he's too old to play soccer, but he still roots for his favorite soccer teams, including the Panyi football club he helped found. The end.